Put anything in my fingers? <laughs> Nails are already clipped. So the Prophet والسلام, was indicating this when he said, a woman is sought after for four things. They, be, they may be married for four things. Her wealth, her lineage, her beauty, and her religious commitment. So seek the one who's religiously committed. May your hands be rubbed with dust, meaning may you prosper. When the child arrives, you have to be fair and just by implementing the sunnah. So part of the sunnah is to do a tahniq. And a tahniq is a sunnah that is quite not known to many Muslims. And that is to chew a very tiny piece of date until it's really soft. And then you attach it to the ceiling of the child's uh, um, throat from the inside, his mouth or her mouth. And they used to do this with the blessed people of the time, which was the Prophet ﷺ. So they used to take their children to the Prophet ﷺ. And nowadays, they usually take their children to the Imam of the Masjid, to the scholars, to the righteous people whom they think they are righteous, so that they would do this type of sunnah. Part of the sunnah is to choose a good name. And you have to be fair with your children by giving them all good names. The best of names for men? No, not Muhammad. Muhammad is one of the beautiful names, of course. But there's nothing in the sunnah to indicate that we should call our children Muhammad. The Prophet says, in the hadith is Sahih Bukhari, the best of names or the more beloved names to Allah, Abdullah wa Abdul Rahman. So these are the most beloved names. But of course, if you call your son Muhammad, that's a, a, a plus. Unlike what they do in some countries, they give their children confusing names and then they wonder why they are so confused in life. So they call him Muhammad Tariq Ismail. And you say, oh, MashaAllah, your father is Tariq? He said, no. Your grandfather is Ismail? He said, no. So who's Muhammad Tariq Ismail? He says, me. <laughs> so I don't know why the confusion. They use Muhammad as a blessing. And the second name is the actual name. And this is, I don't know, I'm not gonna speak about that now. <laughs> Time is very limited. Then part of the sunnah is to shave the head of the newborn and to weigh the hair. The equivalent of its weight in silver is to be given in charity. Is this to be done with the girls? An issue of dispute. I personally do that to my girls. I did that to my girls. Why? Because the hadith indicated, the Prophet said, Amitu anhu al adha. Remove the filth from the child's scalp. And this applies for both boys and girls. So you do this, and this would ensure, inshallah, a good growth for the hair. Aqiqah is also part of the sunnah that you have to do for your children. And that is to slaughter two rams, two sheep, two goats on behalf of a male child and one on behalf of a female child. And this is an indication that there are aspects in Sharia where men are double the women. For example, in inheritance, when a father dies, the man, uh, the boy gets twice his sister's share. Also in aqiqah, also in testimony. A, the testimony of a man is equivalent to the testimony of two women. Also in blood money. If you kill a man, you pay a lot. Astaghfirullah, <laughs> <laughs> edit this. <laughs> it will go. This is a problem. So if you kill a man by mistake, of course, by an accident, you pay the equivalent of 100 camels. If you pay, if you 
uh, uh, rampage a woman mistakenly, you pay 50. This is a sunnah. So this is the blood money. And the fifth type of difference is in itq, when you free a slave. So if you free a slave man, Allah will free with each limb of his, a limb of yours from hellfire. But if you free two slave women, this would happen to you as well. These are the five types. I and mean, this is not our topic, but who cares? So uh, part of, of also the rights of our children upon us is circumcision. And this is mandatory for male children, not for female children. And there is a difference between Islamic circumcision and female um, genital mutilation, FGM, I think they call it. And this is totally haram and prohibited and not from Islam at all. Then we have part of being fair to your children is that you sponsor them and you, gave the, you give them maintenance and spend on them. The Prophet says, alayhi salatu wasalam, it is enough sin for a man not to give food to the one whom he is supposed to feed. And so many men fall into this sin when they work overseas and neglect their children and their wives. They don't give them anything. Some of them even neglect them while they're here in this land because they're getting benefits and they're taking all the benefits from the government and leaving their children unattended and forcing the women to work sometimes two jobs to provide for the family and he's on his PlayStation 4 playing with the boys. All of this shows who's the man in the family. Probably she's the one wearing the pants, but this is part of the unfairness and injustice that we sometimes have. So it is the right of the children to be provided for by their parents, specifically the father. Now, unfortunately, lots of us fathers and parents force our children to be undutiful to us and to disrespect us. So many of us, because we executed what Allah told us to do by taking care of our children, providing for them, feeding them, clothing them, taking care of their medical expenses, taking their care of their educational expenses, once the child becomes a man and he starts to work, the father expects his son to pay him back. And the father is healthy. The father is still earning. The father has property. The father has investments. Okay, fear Allah, what are you doing? So no, 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 I have a dozen uh, children. They have to all work and give me. This is mafia. This is not a real parent. A real father has dignity. I would never ever ask any of my children for a dime until I am bedridden or dead broke. Even if my children are rich, I would never ask them for anything. I would still give them gifts on Eid. I would still pay for whatever they need if they're in need because I am the father. To ask your children to pay you so that you can take their money and give it to your, to, to, to your siblings. Take their money and give it to your co-wives that are not his mother. This is injustice. He's not obliged to do this. And this is unfair because you're ordering your children to pay for your, not needs, for your luxury when they're not able to pay for their own wives and children. Some of them are not able to get married because of this. This is injustice. Some, and I know cases, not one or two, cases where the man rejects proposals for his daughter. Wallahi, three girls, actually not girls, are now women, in their 40s came to me complaining, their teachers, and their father has their ATM card. 
and he gets all their salaries and he rejected a gazillion proposal that's where I'm coming from from Saudi and they're saying what can we do good men reputable men and he doesn't want us to get married others don't allow their daughters to get married so that they can serve him and his children and his wife he needs a maid this is injustice and Allah Azza wa Jal would hold you accountable they are not your slaves you're ordered to treat them and to raise them and to upbring them according to what pleases Allah Azza wa Jal and this injustice is in every family by the way all what you need to do is to look around you and you'll see it clearly unfortunately among the greatest rights of the children is to upbring him according to Islam according to the Quran and to the Sunnah so that you ensure that he is religiously committed that he has the best of moral conduct that you cater for his upbringing spiritually uh, um, his aqeedah his akhlaq his health his social activities all of this you have to take care of while bringing your children and to be fair with them all and among the first that you have to ensure that you install in them is observing salat the prophet says alayhi salatu salam order your children to pray when they're seven and beat them up over it when they're ten of course here this is not advisable because 911 is not going to leave you alone so be careful this is a hadith you have to practice it but not by throwing yourself in harm's way be yani, a little bit uh, um, aware and knowledgeable of the environment you're living in being fair between the children is a must even when it comes to being emotionally involved with them loving them caring for them praising them kissing them Anas ibn Malik reports may Allah be pleased with him that while we were with the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, there was a man sitting next to him and came in a son of this man so he picked him up he hugged him he kissed him and made him sit on his thigh he's sitting next to the prophet then came in a girl of his young daughter so he picked her up and placed her in front of him no kissing no hugging so the prophet said alayhi salatu salam shouldn't you be fair with both of them shouldn't you treated them in the same fashion why by nature we men love boys as children because we think of them as our uh, uh, a rock when they grow up they're going to defend us they're going to take care of us not knowing that girls just want to have fun <laughs> girls they are the joy of life Allah Azza wa has blessed me with 13. No boys. I'm growing a uterus at the moment, but <laughs> may Allah make it easy for all of us. And Alhamdulillah Azza wa Jal, they take real good care of you. Boys, on the other hand, yes, they could help. They could add some value, but they're not as affection, affectionate, maybe. I don't know if this is the right word. Uh, they're not as merciful as girls so in the old times in the Arabs would prefer men they were ashamed of having girls they're ashamed of having uh, uh, females as offspring to the extent that they used to kill them that was the trend a guy gets a baby girl he buries her because he's ashamed of her. So Ibrahim al nakhi says the Salaf used to want and encourage people to be fair even in kisses. Don't kiss one of your children more than the other. This would cause enmity, jealousy, 
hatred among one another. And of course, the Prophet said that clearly in so many times, Ittaqullah wa adilu fi awladikum. Fear Allah and be, uh, and be fair between your children. Now, being ch uh, fair between the children originates from a very famous hadith. You all know. And Nu'man ibn Bashir ibn Sa'd, may Allah be pleased with them, says that my mom went to my father, al-Bashir ibn Sa'd, and asked him for a gift for me. So he gave me a slave man. In another narration, a property, a plot. My, ma my mother was an intellectual, intelligent woman. She said, I will not accept such a gift until you make the Prophet ﷺ a witness. Because he would approve it or reject it. So the, the, the al-Bashir went to the Prophet and he said, I gave my son, al numan this gift. So the Prophet asked him a very straightforward question. Have you given all of your children an equivalent gift? He said, no. He said, then give it back or take it back. And another narration, I do not testify upon injustice. And in another narration, he asked him a second question. Would you like all of your children to be equal in being dutiful and respectful to you? He said, yes, of course. I don't want one to be less than the other. In another narration, the Prophet said, be fair between your children in gifts as you love that they are fair between you in kindness and being dutiful. So this hadith clearly states that in gifts, you cannot favor one child over the other. Even if one child is 40 years old and the other one is one year old, you have to give them equivalent gifts. Now, Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, says, a woman came to me with two girls asking for food. I had nothing in my house except a date. Imagine the wife of the Prophet has nothing in the house except a date. And we have so much in our kitchen. Uh, uh, drawers, uh, cupboards. Um, well, I don't know, you know. So I, I apologize. It's not my first language. So I have to think of words sometimes. I never go to the kitchen. But I do, I do sometimes cook. Yes, to, to clear the record. So she gave her one date. That's the only thing she had in the Prophet's house. The woman split it into two halves and gave each one half of it. Mother Aisha was shocked. She'd never seen such thing. So when the Prophet came, والسلام, she told her. And the Prophet said, whoever is tested by means of these girls and he treats them with kindness, they will be a protection for him from the fire. Ya Allah. Two, even one. Just be kind to the girls. But what we want to learn from this story is that the woman was what? Fair with both of her daughters by giving them half of it. So, I know our time is limited and I don't want to be interrupted before I give you the, um, the juice. So there are a number of important things we have to understand because this causes a lot of confusion in a lot of the people's heads. Number one, there is a difference between allowance and a gift. A gift is uncalled for. It's Eid tomorrow. And I give this is a, a, in, in my country, in Eid of Ramadan, we give money to our kids. So we give them all equal. Those who are 40 years of age and those who are 15 years of age. The same amount. They cry, this is not fair. I'm a, 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 an employee, I'm a university student. This is a gift. We have to be fair. An allowance is different. 
the, the child that goes to uni is going to get pocket money different than the one that goes to primary school. Definitely. When I want to buy clothes, the clothes I buy to the boys are way, way different than the clothes I buy to the girls. Unless they come out of the closet, <laughs> then we have a problem. May Allah forbid, may Allah make them all outside. So girls need more clothes, needs more attention than boys. Boys, a pair of jeans and a t-shirt. That's it. The girls need to be yeah, need, uh, adornment and dresses and not lots of things different. Likewise, if I take one child to hospital and I have an operation and I spend two, three thousand dollars, the rest of the kids don't have the right to say, be fair. I said, okay, I'll open your stomach and then <laughs> I'll give you the money. This, this is different. This is an allowance. Number two, are boys and girls equal in gifts? Yes or no? Always when asked an, a fiqhi question, say there is an issue of dispute. There are two opinions. Be safe. If you say yes and it's no, you'll be embarrassed. So it is an issue of dispute. Some scholars say they have to be different as per the inheritance. Allah says, Allah instructs you concerning your children that is their portion of inheritance for the male what is equal to the share of two females. But this is in what? In inheritance when you die. Our scholars in Saudi Arabia, Sheikh Ibn Baz, Ibn Rathimin, they say two for the boys, one for the girls. So if you want to give a gift, give a thousand dollars to your son, 500 to the girls. Other scholars like Imam Baghawi in Sharh al-Sunnah and others, and this is what I am inclined to follow, that they have to be equal. Why? Because this is not inheritance, I'm still alive. Two, because the Prophet asked An-Nu'man alayhi salatu wasalam, do you have children other than him? He said, yes. Do you like them all to be equal in being respectful and dutiful? He said, yes. He said, then be equal in giving them equal shares. And he did not differentiate between boys and girls. So I am inclined that they should all be the same as a gift. Number three, is the mother obliged to be fair in gifts similar to the father? The mother is the same, no. Of course she does. She has to. She is held accountable on the day of judgment for, fa fa for favoring some of her children over the other. And this happens a lot in the subcontinent. Sheikh, what do you have against the subcontinent? Oh, wallahi, I have no beef. <laughs> there are brothers and sisters and we love them. We, we grew up with them all our lives. But wrong practices have to be changed. Lots of the families hoard gold in large quantities for their daughters to get married. And the poor boy has such nothing. And the problem is that even when this girl gets married and they send her away with such gold, her dot 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 husband, after a year, takes the gold and run away. <laughs> and I have hundreds of cases coming to me. Sheikh, my mother-in-law took my gold. She's a thief. Wallahi, she's a thief. She first wants me to serve and to cook and to clean the house for her and her siblings and their husbands. So I'm a maid. And not only that, she also took my, my, my gold and is refusing to return it. And now they want me to file for khular. Bunch of thieves and crooks. But this is not our topic, again. So, yes, the mother has to be fair with her children in gifts like the father is. Number four, is the grandfather obliged to be fair with his grandsons? I know this, I know this. To be Allah, fear Allah. You see, you, you can't give the topic its due right in like 20, 25 minutes because 
this is something that we need to practice, to learn. It's not here, we're not here to joke, I hope. So anyhow, I'll try to wrap it up uh, to the best of my ability. As a grandfather, am I obliged to be fair with my grandchildren? The answer is issue of dispute. Always be safe rather than sorry. It's an issue of dispute. And the most authentic opinion is that no, you're not a father, you're a grandfather. And the enmity between the grandchildren is negligible compared to the enmity between the sons and daughters to their di direct father. But if you're going to favor some of your grandchildren because you favor their father or their mother, this would cause enmity between your own children. Uh, he favors our children because he loves that individual, his son, but he doesn't love the other sons more. So this is haram. But if it's not, try to do it discreetly and no problem, inshallah. Number five, can the father increase in gifts due to an incentive? And this is frequently asked question. My son goes to uni and he's an A plus student and the other son doesn't. He works in a garage or as a mechanic. So can I give incentives to the, the, the kid that does well in school? The answer is no. Because the one who doesn't go to school is going to hate him. So you have to be fair in gifts. Tab Sheikh, this son of mine is a half of the Quran. I'd like to favor him. You can, providing you ask the rest of your children, do you mind if I favor Muhammad with an extra gift because he just memorized the whole Quran? If they say yes, willingly, no pressure, not out of embarrassment, out of real love and care, you have the green light, you can go and do so. Um, okay, let me skip this, skip this. If one of my children works in my shop or in my company, can I give him something because of his work? The answer is no, unless you treat him as a stranger. So anyone working in his position, how much would you give him as a salary? X amount, give it to him. Equally treating him. Now I know people are looking at the children and say, ah, now see, you're, you're the vice president of my company and you're getting, no, 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 no. He has to be qualified and he has to get exactly similarly to what any other Tom, Dick or Harry would get if they were to assume that position. But to favor him because he's been working with you for the past 20 years and give him something that's more, more, no, this is not halal at all. Finally, if one of my children goes to uni and needs a car, so can I buy him a car and the other children don't have cars? The answer is yes, providing. Hmm. What kind of a car? <laughs> providing what? Providing that the car is in my name. Because I might die today, and then if it's in his name, he's gonna claim it, and that would be a gift. But if it's in my name, after death, it's gonna be distributed to the heirs. And there are so many things that I have compiled, but alhamdulillah, apparently there's not enough time. But I hope this may help in opening our eyes how to be fair and just with our parents. Remember, Prophet Yaqub, peace be upon him, he's a prophet, a son of a prophet, Ishaq, a son of a prophet and a messenger, Ibrahim, yet he was fair and just, yet he could not hide his feelings. Every one of his children knew that he loved Yusuf more than anyone else. What did they do to Yusuf? You know the story. And he was fair and just. So imagine how our children would feel against one another if we tend to every time, you're not like your brother Abdullah. Abdullah is this, Abdullah is that, Abdullah. And the guy is being reprimanded for how good Abdullah is. Next thing you, you, you'll know he's gonna get a Glock. May Allah Azza wa protect you all. على نبينا محمد
Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. So we have um, some questions that have come in, and um, I will fire them off, Sheikh, for your answer, inshallah. The Glock? <laughs> um, so one question is, to what extent should we believe in black magic being so common nowadays, especially back home? Black magic is mentioned in the Quran, in verse number 102, chapter 2, Surah Al-Baqarah. فَيَتَعَلَّمُونَ مِنْهُمَا مَا يُفَرِّقُونَ بِهِ بَيْنَ الْمَرْءِ وَزَوْجَهِ It is mentioned in the Quran. So who in his right mind would object to it? It's also mentioned in Sahih Al-Bukhari that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had a spell casted upon him. And it was mentioned that he was cured by getting the spell out and it was burnt. It was done by Labid ibn al-Asam who was a Jew. So there is no doubt in the existence of black magic. However, the doubt is in a lot of the Muslims' heads when they tend to blame everything on such supernatural uh, uh, phenomena. So my boss hates my guts. He doesn't give me an increment or a raise. I think there is an evil eye. My kid flunked his second year in medical school. I, this, I think this is envy. My wife is nagging all the day. Mashallah, she speaks like 23 hours and 59 minutes a day, nonstop. I think she's possessed by jinn. And my mother-in-law always comes at the wrong times to my home and she spends like three months without nonstop. I think this is black magic. No, this is totally bogus. This is our faults and shortcomings. When we are unable to justify them or solve them, we tend to blame these things over them. And there's nothing like that. Yes, they exist. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, Akhi, who would have the power to do black magic just to uh, do such trivial things? Let them go to Israel. Do some black magic there, do some jinn possession, do whatever you want, Akhi. Inshallah, I will not say it's halal, but yani, give us a break. If it can solve problems, it would have solved problems. Yes, we do uh, yani, um, uh, acknowledge. And I've seen this and I've been through cases like this where newlywed would not be able to function due to something like that. And the guy is, one of them came to me. I don't want to waste your time. Anyhow, this is beside the point. I get someone tapping my shoulders. It's like we have this time. No, no, continue. This story sounds really intriguing. I can finish my lecture. <laughs> <laughs> so... A guy came to me some years ago, called me on the phone. Assalamu alaikum, alaikum salam, Talib Nabu Naya Janagla. Sheikh, I have a problem. I got married two months ago. I've, I'm unable to consummate my marriage. I said, Well, maybe you have impotency problems. Go to see the doctor. He said, said Sheikh, I'm as strong as a bull. I'm 21 years old. SubhanAllah. Maybe your house is filled with haram and movies and music and shaitan is overwhelming you. Shaykh, I am studying and teaching Quran in Medina Masjid of the Prophet ﷺ in the tahfidh circles. So, whoa, this guy is high rank, more high ranking than, than me. So I said, Akhi, this is not natural, but I think that you have either jinn or magic in you. I don't know. So, Sheikh, can you do ruqya to me? That was on the phone. I said, if I do ruqya on you, all the jinn in me will come to you. <laughs> Believe me, trust me, you don't want this. But I'll advise you to do something. He's in Medina. Make your ihram and go to Mecca and do tawaf and, and sa'i, do your umrah, cut your hair, come back to the Kaaba, pray two rak'ahs, raise your hands, in the, near the Kaaba, in, in, in the Haram, and say, Oh Allah, I'm helpless. I have no one to turn to, and there's no one on earth could, who could cure me except you. Oh Allah, I'm not leaving until I'm cured. 
and praise Allah, offer salutation upon the Prophet and give dua from your, the bottom of your heart. And wallahi, you will be fine. Zakallah khair, zakallah khair. That was like 10 o'clock or 8 o'clock in the evening. Following morning, about 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock in the morning, I get a call. Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. May Allah reward you. He makes dua like everybody else. Yeah, yeah, I've heard this. Do you have money? <laughs> so he's making dua, making dua. I said, Akhi, who are you? I don't remember. I get gazillion calls a day. He says, oh, I called you yesterday. But, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember now. So when are you coming? He said, oh, Sheikh, the moment I hung up, I drove five hours to Mecca. Did my Umrah in a couple of hours. Drove back another five hours, that's 12 hours on the road. And the moment I reached home, I consummated the marriage. God, this is better than Viagra. I, I should try this. Subhanallah, if you believe, Wallahi, nothing can stand in your way. All what you have to do is trust Allah, rely on Him, depend on Him. We have a problem on depending on our biceps on our strength or our intellect or our degree on who you know not what you know not depending on Allah Azza wa Jal. the moment a child falls sick what's the first thing you do doctor doctor please help my child he has this fever real Muslims start with Ruqya and then they go to the emergency room trust Allah Azza wa Jal. so what was the question to begin with <laughs> Okay, black magic. So does it exist? It does exist. It does exist without any doubt, and Allah knows best. Um, the next question is that, <clears throat> is it true that we can change other with dua? And if everything is written, how can making dua change what is written? So I'll ask you a question. Do you know what is your qadr? Yes or no? So how do you know if you make dua, that it change or did not change? You don't know. So, Akhi, Qadr is something that Allah had written 50,000 years before creating the universe. It's fixed. But also told us, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, that the dua can change Qadr. So, I make dua. So, how could it change something that was written 50,000 years ago before creating the universe? Because in what was written, the dua was also written, it will change. So Allah Azza wa Jal pre-divined that I will have an accident on X, Y, Z day. And I make dua, Ya Allah, save me, Allah, protect me. And then underneath that, it's written because of the dua that this person did, the accident will be avoided. This son of his will fall sick and should die. But because of his Dua and his mother's dua, Allah Azza wa Jal cured him and made him live. So yes, dua is part of the qadr. But you do not know what is written for you. So you make dua and trust Allah. Whatever is good for you will happen. Don't say I made dua and nothing happened. This is because you don't have belief. And that's why Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't respond to your Dua because you don't believe. But if you believe, Allah will make things happen better than you what you have uh, anticipated. Um, the next question, Sheikh, is <clears throat> I have been married for a few months now and I had followed all the Islamic guidelines. My mother is not talking to me and it's been more than six months, even though I've tried my best to reach out to her, but she wants nothing to do with me. I'm not sure what else I can do. Why? So how would I know? <laughs> see, see such questions, they assume that I have a crystal ball. <laughs> I don't. But because I've done a lot of counseling, I could tell. Number one, either he married her against his, her mother's, uh, his mother's will. So she's from a different tribe, different clan, different ethnicity, and or not the mother's niece as usual. <laughs> Number two, he married her, but he's not allowing his mother to control her. So she's living in a joint family, 
but the mother is not happy because she wants her to wake up early after Fajr, start cooking breakfast and cleaning and doing the chores and washing and ironing and everything. And he, as a real man, says, no, she's obliged only to serve me. I married her. You want to have her? You marry her. But alhamdulillah, this is not halal in Islam. So I'm the one who married her. She serves me and my children. Three, a possibility that he married this woman. The mom was happy. Everything was fine. He moved out. And the mom is refusing to talk to him because he's breaking the family ties and his siblings are thinking of doing the same and she's losing grip over her flock. So until I know the reason, but, but you get the point, Annie. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty good assessment, sure. Allah. Um, the next question is, <clears throat> uh, what is expected of Muslims other than our prayers and charity towards the people of Gaza? Akhi, we don't have only the people of Gaza. We have calamities all over the world. But Gaza stands out because the injustice is so crystal clear that even the blind could see it. Even the disbelievers would join hands with us and saying that this is unfair, this is injustice. What's the point of a veto for the third time and the 36th time in the history of the United Nations against the Palestinians. What is the message that you are siding by peace lovers, democracy, human rights, all this baloney? No, this is a lot of BS. And the masks have been removed. We know who the enemy is. So yes, as individuals, what can we do? Nothing except to do dua and to financially help in all means that we can. Because a penny matters. And if you look at the way we spend our wealth lavishly, wallahi, when we die, nothing is going to help us in our graves. We won't be able to put a bulb light. <laughs> yeah, can I have some light? No, it's dark. It's lonely. It's cold. But whatever you give, it's going to be stored for you there. The Prophet says, alayhi salam, in a very beautiful hadith, Al-mar'u fi dhilli sadaqatihi yawm al-qiyamah. On the day of judgment, each one of you will be in the shade of his charity. The narrator of this hadith, he says, Wallahi, not a single day passed, except I would give in charity, even if it's an apple, if it's a, a donut, if it's anything, I just have to give something in charity every single day. So we can do this, dua. And don't think that dua is something that is, okay, um, I'll make um, 30 seconds dua, and that's it. I've done my due diligence to Palestine. Khalas, what else do you want? No, you have to do dua in every sujood. In between Adhan and Naqama, in the last third of the night, when the rooster calls, when it's raining, when this, when... Uh, do select the times of answering your dua. And at the same time, you have to give. Thirdly, you have to share their plight with the whole world to see these atrocities, to know who our real enemies are. Those who are, are siding by Israel are our enemies. We don't have to you know, be rocket scientists to know this. And this is what they're trying for us not to abide and by and to believe. We are Muslims. We're, we don't have nationalities. We don't have borders. One brother in the east of the world is being tortured and killed, he's my brother. One brother in the West is suffering, he's my brother. They don't want us to do this. No, they want they to segregate us, to separate us, to feel that I am from this nationality, I'm from that nationality, we're different, we're better. No, we're not. 
every time someone tells me about my ethnicity, where are you originally from? I said, um, Alhamdulillah, my lineage is very prestigious and high. And I, I boast about that all the time. My great-great-grandfather is a, is a prophet. He's Adam. <laughs> so what's the point? Who are you? Nothing. It doesn't matter what document you carry. What matters is what's in your heart, what you do, what you say, how you believe, how you feel towards your brothers. So, in a nutshell, you can't do anything but to be peaceful, but be vocal. And according to the Quran and Sunnah, don't exceed your limits. Share with the whole world their plight, and may Allah Azza wa make this our jihad for their cause. Um, Sheikh, the next question is, are steroids halal? <laughs> I'm not a doctor. I can't tell. I know that it is taken sometimes to cure some illnesses and to fix some infections. And, but if you mean, do I take steroids or anabolic steroids? I've never taken anything that's not natural in my life with the grace of Allah. So I don't do this stuff. And I serious, it's, I mean, uh, sincerely and seriously feel sorry for those who take it. Why are you taking it? To buff yourself? This is not natural. Eat natural food and work out and exercise. And why do you do it? I mean, so many people do it and they go to the gym and they become so huge and one small evil eye. Well, and the guy is on the ground. So what's the point? I think, but I can't say if it's halal or haram, this requires a medical profession, professional to come and, and say when to be taken, when not to be taken, and the reasons for that, and Allah knows best. Sheikh, this next question, uh, the context you will know. Um, How, I don't have a crystal ball? <laughs> I don't know. So, How do you get upgraded to an air conditioner? By being a big fan. When you become a big fan, Allah will promote you to a big... Akhi wallahi, this statement I said and I regretted saying. It was during a live uh, um, uh, program on TV. And the guy called, and it was in the midst of serious questions. So when someone calls, Salaam Alaikum Alaikum Salaam Sheikh, I'm your biggest, biggest fan. So may Allah promote you to be a, a, a big air conditioner. <laughs> yes, what's your question? And he went on here, he didn't hear the, the, the comment. I don't know how people leave a full hour of serious halal, haram, aqeedah, uh, marriage, divorce issues, and they focus on this and they extract it. And every time I meet some of my fans, say, Sheikh, I'm your biggest fan. Huh? Huh? I'm waiting. So I think I have to find another catchphrase, maybe better than that. <laughs> Sounds good, Shay. Um, the next question is, how can I achieve khushu in my prayers? No, this requires a long, long, long session. Khushu is not steroids. <laughs> it's not a pill you take, alhamdulillah, now, Khushur is a lifestyle, is a conviction. I always tell this to people who come to me. You've heard it a gazillion times, it's boring, but who cares? People come, Sheikh, my wife doesn't wear the hijab. Sheikh, my son smokes. Sheikh, my husband is addicted to porn. Sheikh, this, Sheikh, that. I say to them, all of these are symptoms. If someone comes to you and says, I have a severe headache, I think here you, you give them Tylenol. So in, in, in Saudi, we have Panadol. So give them two Tylenols, mashallah, six hours, no headache. He comes back, oh, it came back again. Take two Tylenols. And you do this for a whole week. Did I help him? No, probably he has cancer. He has something that is serious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has a serious illness, chronic illness. The symptoms are the headache. So by giving him what cures the symptoms, not 
the illness itself, I'm not helping him. Likewise, all of our problems are going back to the chronic illness. That is, not knowing Allah. We have a huge void in our hearts. It's empty. That's why we feel depressed so many times. That's why so many times we're agitated. We, we're not happy. You can see it in the people's faces. They're working nine to five and they take two hours to commute and two hours to come back. And they have to pay the rent and they have to, well, here the rent is, man, compared to Toronto. <laughs> Anyhow, um, and they have problems with the kids. They have problems with the wife, the in-laws, the food, the debts, the, so many things. This is the void in your heart. I went to Pakistan last year and Subhanallah, in Pakistan, the people are yani, stone broke, below poverty lines, and yani, seriously. But I see people with 13 or 14 family members living in shanty houses or tin houses, no running water. Salam alaikum, Sheikh, please come. And the smile is from here to here. And he doesn't say I'm your biggest fan because he doesn't even have a fan. <laughs> And the guy invites me to a biryani. He said, we, we, we received this three nights ago from a leftover from the wedding. Come, Sheikh, Bismillah. It's, it's, it's baraka, baraka. I said, Akhi, this is not sufficient for me alone. It's, it's only a couple of spoons, let alone your family. He said, no, 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 say Bismillah. Allah will put baraka, Sheikh. Allah has graced us. La ilaha illallah. Where can I get this Iman? His heart is filled with the love of Allah. He doesn't look at the half empty of the glass or the empty glass because he has a glass. We have bottles and still we think that Allah has not favored us or blessed us. Khushur does not come until you know who Allah is, until you know who, what's his beautiful names and attributes. Isn't it a shame that when someone says Allah has 99 names, and you're asked, how many names do you memorize? He said, mm, like 15. And then someone asks you about, of these 15 names, how many do you the, name, the meaning of? Mm, maybe one or two. Then how would you say Allahu Akbar and start to pray? It's empty. You don't know who you're talking to. When you say Subhana Rabbi al -Azim. you don't know who you are bowing to or prostrating to. Therefore, to do khushur, we need much more time and space and an and open hearts to rectify our affairs. Our whole lifestyle is rubbish, or as they say in England, rubbish. It is nonsense. We're not abiding by the Quran or by the Sunnah. We do good deeds. I have to admit, mashallah, the brothers pay generously for the cause of Allah. The brothers may offer night prayer. The sisters may cook food for Ramadan. They're contributing to the community. But we always think that we have credit. What, that, what do you mean, Sheikh? Akhi, you're making a call. Yeah, I have credit. It's international call. Sheikh Hassan doesn't answer the mobile, WhatsApp or FaceTime. Only international call. You can call me any time of the day or night. My number is open to all, it's free. But I don't receive except one call a day, and it has to be less than three minutes. Any quick, rapid fire question. Not, Sheikh, I'd like to tell you about my problem since childhood. <laughs> no, don't. I'm gonna hang up. So, you call, and you get the answer. What did I, what brought me this issue? Huh? Yeah. I love, I totally lost it. Uh, age, age, and 13 daughters, and the uterus. <laughs> I forgot. Anyhow, to get khushur, you have to fill the void in your heart. You have to learn Allah's beautiful names and attributes. You have to change. Yes, when you give, I have credit. I ah, see, you're asleep. Half asleep, no, more than me. What do we mean by we have credit? We all are like this. I'm among you. I go take Umrah. So I finish my Umrah. I live one hour away from Kaaba. Alhamdulillah. So taking Umrah is piece of cake. 
While driving back, shaitan comes to me and said, why don't you listen to some music? Astaghfirullah, I just did Umrah. I said, yes, you have a clean book. You have credit. Hmm, okay. So I listened to some music. Go back home. Why did you want watch Netflix? I don't have it. Well, subscribe. Game of Thrones, season 16. Good. Okay, I have credit. This is our biggest problem. We treat Allah that we have credit. I've done good things in my life. I've done charity, I've done night prayer, I've fasted Monday, so I have credit. And this is the void in our hearts. We don't have fear of Allah. We think that, no, I've done so many things. Allah Azza wa should give me more. So once you fill the void in your heart by knowing Allah, by being humble, then inshallah you have khushu on Allah knows best. Um, last, uh, probably two questions. Um, there are a couple that are very similar in theme, so I'll just ask one of them. If the parents are against two individuals to get married, can they have a secret nikah? No. A woman cannot be married without the consent and approval of her father. A woman's marriage is dependent on her father. If her father gives her the green light, even if her mother fights tooth and nail against it, it has no value. Because the mother's opinion in her daughter's marriage is not of essence. She's emotionally motivated and many reasons drive her. What counts in Islam is the opinion and the consent of the father. If the father agrees, let's go to the groom's side, the man. The man does not need anyone's approval, nor his, neither his father, nor his mother, nor anyone else. So if he's financially dependent, he's a real man, and the girl checks all the boxes, but his parents don't want her because she's not fair, she's not white. She's dark, she's fat, she's this, she's that. Her parents are not from the same level as we are. We went to their home, they don't have security with AK-47. People come to me like this. In Pakistan, <laughs> I went to some of the people's houses, they have like 10 guards with AK-47. I was scared. <laughs> what is this? It's, no, no, Sheikh, this is um, every day. They come with me in the car, scary business. So some people say, no, if they're not from the same level, then no, you cannot marry her. She doesn't have a job. She doesn't earn. Why, am I looking for a sugar mummy? I don't want her to earn. I want her to sit home and to cook and to take care of my children. I'm the man who's supposed to give every single dime needed in the house, not her. So if you are a financial independent and she checks all the boxes, go ahead and don't look behind. So Sheikh, just to add to that, you were um, also sharing that one story where um, the father kept on denying his daughters who are 40 years old now to get married. What happens in that situation? Where I told them, I told them, ditch your father and go to the uh, Islamic court and get married. Such a father from day one. See, now I make a long, a short story long. Lots of the girls come to me, she says, Sheikh, I met this boy in uni and I want to marry him. He's religious, he's hafiz, he's got a big beard and mashallah is practicing and we love one another. First of all, he's not practicing. You can't fall in love and have a relationship and being a hafiz and long beard. Come on, who are you fooling? He said, Sheikh, no, no, this is the norm in here in Canada and in America and Europe. So I don't know your level of practicing. How could a person be practicing when he has illicit haram relationship with a woman on the phone or in texting and he says I'm a hijab she's a hijabi and I'm a beardy <laughs> what, what is this this is Dr. Jekyll Mr. Hyde but none of my business so Sheikh uh, my father rejected him so can we go to the Muslim judge to get married that says no Sheikh he's uh, rejecting a good man even though it's his rights to reject but if he rejected four or five good suitors Without any legitimate reason, now you can overwrite and go to the Muslim judge. Not from the first instance or the second instance, because I'm a father. 
I gave birth to this, to this girl and I've taken care of her for all of my life. Now it's a mutual decision. I cannot marry her off to someone she doesn't like. No, you have to marry your cousin. Dad, I don't want like my cousin. I said, no, you have to. No, this marriage is invalid. Forced marriage is invalid. And she cannot marry without my approval. As they say, it takes two to tango. Halal Nasheed. She's your spouse. Nothing halal. So I hope this answers. No, that is. That is true. Um, <clears throat> I guess uh, one last question. There's, there's a few like this, but um, is it halal to become a real estate agent? Two. Is it halal to become a real estate agent? It is halal to become a real estate agent, providing that you do not involve yourself in anything haram. Sheikh, all those who buy property, buy them through mortgage and it's haram. It's none of your business where they get the money from. You're a real estate agent. You sell. But... If you're going to help them fill up the mortgage form or you tell them, well, this bank gives 4.7% and that bank gives, I, my recommendation is for this bank or do the due diligence for the bank and help the bank and communicate with the bank to facilitate such a loan. No, this is haram. Make sense? Yeah. Thank you so, so much.